Hey everybody, uh, this is the first in a series of videos to introduce the computer organization students to assembly language programming through the use of a awesomely fun old retro game, AT Robots. Uh, in this game, users don't control the players with joysticks and keyboards and mice. Instead, you write assembly language programs that control uh, embedded system tanks uh, to move around an arena, to do whatever it is you like, to scan each for each other, uh, shoot weapons at each other, drop landmines, or, or just uh, do interesting movements and behaviors. Uh, so let's take a quick look at what an AT robot is. Uh, so an AT robot is just a simulated tank, and they show up on the screen as really raw-looking triangles, but underneath there's all these other details. So each tank uh, has a drive system, uh, and so there are throttle ports that you can use to make the tanks or make the robots go forward or backward at various speeds. You can go up to 100% straight ahead or uh, up to 75% uh, top speed in reverse. Uh, the robots also have a turret that is centered uh, on the middle of the robot. Uh, it initially points in the same direction of the robot, uh, but you can turn it independently and it will maintain that offset even as the robot uh, turns around. Uh, there are ways to adjust that so that it keeps its compass direction relative to the world, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, this turret is the point from which you shoot a weapon, uh, to target other robots, uh, but it's also the center for a scan that kind of comes out in the shape of a, uh, a pie arc. Uh, you can scan the arena in the direction of the turret for other robots uh, and get primitive information like whether that uh, the closest robot, uh, if there was one, how far away was it and uh, was it kind of to the middle or to the right or to the left. Uh, you can get that kind of info from this turret. Uh, when you scan anyway. Also centered on the turret is a radar and sonar type capability that lets you find out interesting information like uh, angles to uh, nearby robots and so on, but they use costly operations uh, and so um, they aren't the fastest way or the leanest way to find other robots. If you want to do those kinds of things you'll have to be uh, creative in writing uh, sophisticated scanning code. Uh, each robot has armor uh, and it needs that armor because when another robot shoots at you or you run over landmines from another robot uh, they will inflict damage. The armor helps dissipate the damage. However, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it has some problems associated with it. Uh, the better your armor the heavier it is and the slower your uh, top speed will become. Also, the heavier your armor is, the more heat it will retain as you uh, are hit by uh, other players' weapons or you're running over mines or another player runs into you or you're nearby somebody else who gets hit by a weapon or blows up a mine and you get some collateral damage. Right? So the heavier your armor, the longer it takes for the heat to dissipate. That means something in this game because uh, as many of you who uh, do hardcore gaming stuff know, uh, you want a nice cold CPU uh, if you want to run games quickly. So as your AT robot heats up, it goes slower and slower. At some point, uh, coming to a complete halt uh, and just stopping in the battlefield until the temperature cools down enough for it to keep going again. Uh, with this in mind, uh, each robot also has heat sinks. The heat sinks allow you, if, if you beef them up, <coughs> excuse me, if you beef up your heat sinks, you can dissipate heat uh, faster. But to do this, uh, or to, to increase the performance of any of these things, you basically have to take some limited stock file of points uh, and redistribute it. So if you want better heat sinks, you're going to have to have maybe a worse engine or a, a weaker, slower weapon, that kind of thing. There are also landmines that you can uh, drop. You can get more mines if you want to use more points toward them. Uh, the landmines can be laid with different levels of sensitivity so that they can uh, only explode if somebody's robot's 
dead center of the robot gets over the dead center of the mine and then kaboom then it causes the most damage but you can make them more sensitive all the way to the point of if there's a robot within half of an arena's worth of distance it will explode the mine but cause almost no damage at all to the robot uh, <clears throat> the final thing that we have in each robot is the wireless transponder. So you can do network communication uh, broadcast to the entire arena if you like. Uh, when you do it, you can just send a number. But uh, if you're writing uh, team robots that coordinate with each other, they can use the wireless channels uh, to identify who they're uh, seeing near to them, uh, who they're scanning, or what kinds of things to do. Uh, in the past, I've seen robots work as a team so that they avoid shooting at uh, the prime robot who's meant to win the most battles, uh, thus skewing the results of a, say, tournament. Uh, I've also seen it used to make interesting, um, for lack of a better term, synchronized swimming robots, uh, where the wireless transponder allows robots to communicate to those who are near to them about what they could do next. Uh, and so all kinds of things can be done with these. Now in just a second we're gonna run a demo of this and when we we do you're gonna see a screen that looks kinda like this uh, and this big space here is the primary <coughs> excuse me the primary arena. The arena is supposed to be a thousand by a thousand uh, meters uh, in size. Uh, to the right by default we have a status area where there's information about each robot how much armor it has. Uh, when your armor level goes down to zero, your robot is dead uh, and you're out of the match. Uh, what your current heat is is shown here in the bar labeled H. Uh, if the heat gets too high, again, you will slow down and eventually come to a stop. It's possible from shooting your weapon, which generates heat, uh, to shoot it too fast too often and raise your heat so quickly that you actually drop your, your armor entirely and effectively self-destruct. So you got to be careful about that. Additionally, there's information here about uh, how many kills this robot is responsible for and how many times it's died over this collection of matches that you run it in. Up above the armor will be a little message that you can create for your robot if you decide to, to have one built in, and I'll show that in another video. Uh, furthermore, there is an error uh, space uh, here in the status area of each robot, uh, and there is a instruction that you can write into your programs where you can effectively print a number using the error instruction, uh, and that number will show up here. Now, if it's happening in a tight loop and it uh, prints that number, prints numbers out over and over again, it may change so quickly that you can't read it, um, uh, and for those situations there is an embedded debugger as well, which I'll show you how to use later. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, it tells you, uh, we don't care about how much free memory we have in our system these days, uh, but it does tell you what cycle of the game you're in, what the cycle limit is, there are limits to the game so that you don't have robots who uh, never find each other, uh, particularly robots that spin kind of in circles around them, so around each other sometimes and never get a, a clean shot and the, the game would last forever if there wasn't a, a match timeout. Uh, and then there's a, an indicator of how many matches you are in. So let's go ahead and see a sample run of this thing. I'm going to load up the DOSBox emulator, which I'll show you how to install uh, in other videos. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, when we launch AT Robots to begin with, we get this really fancy uh, 320 by 240 pixel GUI, which uh, I've set up the DOSBox configuration to uh, double scale so that it at least looks usable. Uh, if you are on a uh, 4K screen, you might even need to change the configuration file to triple uh, the scaler to make this usable, but uh, you can figure that out on your own or ask me about it. So here in each of these black rectangles, a robot has been selected. To pick a new robot for a particular empty rectangle or to replace another one, you can just click uh, the robot numbered box uh, next to the cell. So I'll put uh, Toby1 as an example here in uh, the robot 6 position. If you don't want a robot in a position any longer and you want to remove a robot, uh, you click the vertical pipe. Uh, it's not a great design, but it, that's what it does. Click the vertical pipe and that robot goes away. Uh, 
I've got this set up by default to run 10 matches of all of these robots uh, rather than just one and return to the GUI. Uh, but you can click the M button if you like to change that number. Similarly, you can mess around with all of these parameters if you like. However, uh, I would not uh, change the game delay uh, or the robot time slice. Uh, there's just uh, no good reason to do it and particularly changing the time slice uh, can totally affect the performance of the robots. Uh, this was used um, in the past for specialized tournaments but uh, we aren't going to change this at all so you want to keep the default time slice concept here. Uh, when I go to run this, you're going to hear some terrible noise uh, as the robots shoot, uh, clipping types of sounds or PC speaker beeping. Uh, if you want to turn those off during the game, you can press the S button, S for snake. And if you are in the GUI menu, you can turn those off by clicking Q over here to enable quiet or to toggle quiet mode on uh, or off. I'm going to initially run this. Uh, with the sound on for the first video. So let's uh, run a quick match. I'll hit the play button. The first thing that happens is the robots are attempted to assemble and then we, uh, if that succeeds, we get this screen where we're ready to press a key to start a match. So uh, let's take care of that now. Move this guy away from my buddy. Oh, oh. The clicking sound is just terrible. I'm going to go ahead and click S right now just to turn the sound off. So here you see the robots uh, driving around. Each of them are running a, a unique program independently that controls a CPU inside of that robot. So the robots are their own players programmatically. Uh, you can see these pie-shaped gray uh, areas. That's the robot's scanner, and they're looking for other robots. Uh, one of the robots who just died, Light Blue, the Cyan robot, uh, up in the uh, uh, top left corner right now, Tracker. That one is using either sonar or radar, I can't remember which, uh, but he's got a whole uh, full circle that's rendered because he's searching that particular area. Uh, the Magenta robot, the purple one, Wall, bo wall Bomb, uh, it has a strategy of uh, driving in a straight line toward uh, whatever wall is ahead of it, and while it's moving, it slowly drops a series of landmines in hopes that uh, another unsuspecting robot will run over them. Uh, for all the different sensors that our robots have, one thing they cannot do is detect whether or not they are nearby any other landmines of another robot. Uh, uh, so uh, as the wall bomb robot was destroyed, its landmines stayed behind, and so if another robot is killed by hitting those landmines, wall bomb will still get credit for the kill if that's the, the final straw that destroys whatever that robot is. Let's watch another match. You'll also notice that wall bomb, the purple robot, the magenta robot, has a circle around it. Uh, our robots have the ability to put up shields as well. They weren't in the diagram I showed earlier, but uh, that's because they're not always up, I guess. Uh, I just didn't draw <laughs> into that diagram. But your robots can put up shields, and when they do, it helps protect them from damage from nearby mine blasts or bumping into walls, bumping into robots, or being hit by weapons. Uh, unfortunately, when you have your shield up, it also keeps in your heat. Uh, and as a side effect, if you look at the wall bomb status area, you'll see that that robot's heat just continually rises until eventually it stops moving because it's too hot to continue. Uh, and then when it gets extra extra hot uh, it just self-destructs so that's the basics of AT robots uh, in uh, the next couple videos I'll show you how to get this thing installed uh, it's easiest for those of you who are using Windows mostly because the zip file I've provided if you just um, unzip it somewhere it will basically be ready uh, to use for you. So uh, just to give you an example, uh, when you take that zip file and open it up and you're a Windows user, you'll get a folder called DOSBox. And if you go right into it, there's a DOSBox executable. And all you should have to do is double click on it to run it and get that GUI up and start messing around 
uh, with the robots or writing your own. But installing for Linux and the Mac operating system is a little bit uh, more technical, so I'm going to put those in separate videos. Uh, I hope you find some interest in AT Robots and look forward to playing with it, uh, and I'll uh, see you in the next video.